What we will try to do is distribute the force or the pressure of elevating the sinus membrane instead of doing that through a lateral window from the buccal surface of the alveolus. We're going to do it from the crest by um, using the actual floor of the sinus in a uh, kind of floor uh, rectangle fashion. Um, and we will uh, then uh, slowly but surely elevate it so that uh, it lifts up the membrane and leaving the sides of the uh, alveolus to uh, allow us to use friction to hold the buccal and palatal surface of the implant and, and stabilize it in place. We will still use a graft. What we will end up with, if you look at this x-ray as a matter of fact, on the right side, the uh, 6 by 5.7 millimeter implant that appears to have a uh, temporary abutment is actually placed in, with that technique. So we're going to do the left side with that same technique. The main reason we're able to apply this technique uh, in this situation is because of the use of the ultra short implants, six millimeter or shorter. Turn your face to me, please. Okay, and the incision we will make to mimic a lateral sinus lift incision because it gives us visibility, but at the same time also gives us a uh, sort of a backup plan. If we need to, for any reason, we can. How are you doing? We can expand this to become a ladder. It's going to have to be open as well, you can please. It's going to have to be pretty wide because we need to see the whole crest. And you don't want to make it so wide as to cause bleeding from the uh, branches of the greater palatine. Turn to me, please, all the way, all the way. I'm a, uh, I'm a big fan of doing curved incisions. They are easier to suture. Uh, yeah, I'm going to hear my, that many times. Dr. Nesperati next to me is shouting, my head is in the picture. Forgive me, I always bring it back out, okay? But I do have to see sometimes, just like you do. Okay, well, incision is made. Let me have the big uh, mirror, mouth mirror, the short one, sorry, the small one. Okay, suction. Open as wide as you can. Okay, can we show them the incision? Okay, can, can you show them? Okay, you see the incision? We do. Okay, we do great. Indeed. Thank you. Thanks, Clive. Okay, now to, the easiest way to elevate these kind of flaps is to actually lever off your thumb. You will go and you want to feel bone all along the incision. And then you will push with the left hand thumb and it peels right off. Okay, this is an area where there had been an extraction not too long ago. So we're going to be able to uh, protect it and lift it up a little bit of a... Here, here, it's not a big deal. Here, here we are. Okay. Good. Okay. And let's have a Selden. What we will use then is a retraction suture, suction. Hold on, please. Okay. We'll make sure we free it all up. And you see the whole entirety of the crest. Let's see what you see. You can see it pretty well this way, right? Okay, good. Let's have a suture. Now, just to simplify my life a little bit, we will use a retraction suture whereby the flap is maintained open without our having to uh, chase it all the time. And since there is a tear, I'm going to first protect that tear so it doesn't propagate and that is by putting a suture temporarily in there. Little details can, can make a, a case go a lot smoother. Hold this please, tissue forceps. Thank you, you have it, yeah, thanks. Okay. We will remove this at the end of the case, let go. Now retract, please. Okay, take that. Suction the back, please. Doing great here. This is only so that this um, the stair doesn't get propagated uh, while we're working, just to protect it. Okay. 
How are you doing, Kathleen? Okay, good. Alrighty. This is the boring stuff, but it's necessary for the kind of smooth functioning of the technique. The goal here is to place one or two implants, okay? Two preferably, one if the uh, area is difficult to di dissect and so on, that will give us certainly a second bicuspid occlusion. All right, and we don't want to keep you here all night while we're placing two implants. And the suture, as you see, is just to the cheek, mucosa. Now the flap is open as soon as the mouth is. Okay. And we're just using a uh, plain, keep your eyes closed now, huh? um, silk suture, which is kind of kind of disposable. All right, so now we'll take another look. We will outline our rectangle. First, what I will do is just mark without making a, uh, a perforation, but mark where I would like these implants to go. I am uh, planning on using six uh, by 5.7 millimeter implants, and that will dictate the width of my, um, turn your face to me please, the width of my rectangle. Turn slightly more, okay good. Open as wide as you can. Yes please. Question was whether or not to use water. We're gonna make a little mark here. And a little mark here. The distal one, it would be ideal if we could get it both, get them both. As you see, it's just the mark. No, I don't need that. I'll take the uh, mirror, intraoral mirror, and we'll show you where those two marks are. Open wide, suction on the mirror. Okay, hold this, please. So this allows me a chance to critique my placement. Okay, can you shine on the mirror, please? Get zoom in and a little bit more focus, out of focus. Perio probe, I got it. Okay, hold on. Honorian, stop moving it. Move a little bit. Okay, okay, that's fine, Nick. Okay, so this is the first. Suction it real quick, right up here. Okay. This is the first perforation right there. This one here, and this is the second. Move it back a little bit drowsy yeah. so it focuses better. Can you see the little, oh, hold on one moment. Okay, here we are, stop. No. So. Okay. All right. So, is one and the other. So the rectangle has to encompass these two. Take a mallet, please. Thank you. So now, in order for us to do this, we will start with the mesial cut. And this is an osteotome that's five millimeters wide. Now, if I make this, excuse me, let me see what they see. If I make the, uh, stay there, I'll move the chisel to you. The, uh, the shorter cuts with this one, and then I make the longer ones inside these two, then I know that the width of my rectangle is not going to be more than five millimeters, okay? And so it goes. Turn a little bit to me. Okay. If you remember from the x-ray, the mesial and distal side uh, are different in thickness. The mesial side is significantly thicker. Okay. The distal side, open as wide as you can, here is not as thick. So you've got to keep that in mind. Sorry about my hair. I can see it in there. Okay. Now... So I've made these two cuts. Now we're going to make the connecting cuts between the two. And for that, I'm going to keep turning the patient to us that way. Move the, yeah. Okay, good. Stay right there, Kathleen, please. Thank you. Mm -hmm. this. Okay, here we are. And this is going to go right in here. Mm -hmm. Now these are, by, by the way, the same uh, osteotomes that we use for maxillary ridge splits. 
You can get fancier ones, but I think these work the best. They are sharp and available. The bone in this in the mesial area is softer because this is a, an area that had had a recent extraction, so the healing isn't complete. Try not to punch the patient when you're doing that, and you stand behind her is better, please. So what we're doing is, Carrie, um, our circulator assistant, is bracing the facial skeleton. Okay, basically at the uh, the nose bridge at the a frontonasal suture, if you apply pressure at a 45 degree angle to the face, you are dampening these blows. And you, you read in the, in the literature about uh, knocking off some calcifications off of the inner ear, so on. By doing this, you limit the amount of vibration transmitted to the skull and the skull contents, including the <coughs> inner and middle ears. Okay, I just want to make sure that these cuts are complete. And you can feel it, really. Um, and always err on the side of shallower because the idea is the bone, when it's scored, will fracture. In there, you don't need to cut it all the way because you risk cutting the membrane, okay? Kathleen, how are you doing, hon? Good. And we're going to go over it a few times. Because, you know, the bone is never of uniform thickness. The x-ray gives you... Um, you know, one dimension, even if you have a CT scan, it's still going to depend on where you end up connecting with that bone suction. And that can vary by, you know, within a millimeter, you'll have a much thicker area or harder area, which a CT will not control for you. <coughs> okay, so now we will show you a, a picture of this rectangle in a minute. All right. And uh, also, incidentally, you know the markings on your osteotomes uh, are at 6 and 8 millimeters. So uh, by staying within a, about the middle of the distance, it's about 3 millimeters, which is the thickness and the thickest part in there. Now we're going to go to um, elevating this floor, and that's by completing the fracture. For that, we will use the sinus osteotomes that are available in the Bicon kit. We start with the 3.5 or 2.5 or 4, whatever fits best within the confines of uh, that rectangle. Let's show you the rectangle, a small uh, mirror please. Okay, don't suction it too much. Mm -hmm. All right. Can you see it? Very right. good. Yeah. Okay, yes, great. we can see that. We'll see that beautifully, thank you. Okay, very well. We'll continue then. So the first area where you want to concentrate is the area that's hardest to fracture. Which one would you guess that would be? Yes, the mesial one. <laughs> so we start there, and all we do is just tap on it. The idea is you're going to mobilize it slowly, and if it doesn't move, you can feel the resonance of it. Yeah, but you need to turn your head a little bit. It's an osteotome. Oh, okay. I'm told that the osteotome is a chisel in the catalog. Okay. Turn slightly to me. Okay, great. Can you see okay? Good. Yes, we can see. Thank you. So can I. So the, the name of the game here, as I repeat usually, is patience. This is the, the time where you really have to exert all the patience that you were given, and then some. Because what we're doing, we scored that bone, now we, we're going to fracture it and carry the membrane up with it. This part, our patient did not like the last time, and it caused her to feel a little bit syncopal, so we preempted this time and, and made her sedated. Right, Kathleen? In fact, the very first case I did uh, it was without any uh, scoring with the chisels. What I want to do is I think we have a little binding uh, 
area and the and the uh, corners i'm going to use a sh smaller uh, chisel the three millimeter chisel and go into the corners those are the hardest to cut and just kind of make sure that the cut is complete okay so we're not doing the work um, twice just completing what we started When we move too much, when it's zoomed this much, uh, it, it gets in and out of focus. So uh, if you find the movement is too much, avert your eyes so you don't get motion sickness. <laughs> Unless Clive is providing you with Dramamine. <laughs> Dramamine, yes. And immediately, as, as soon as we, f we freed up the corners, I feel a little bit more movement now. And a lot of uh, tapping with this, with this technique. Okay, we're moving already. Okay, you can feel, or maybe you can see how that is starting to sort of fall in to the uh, sinus. You probably see it better than I can. So now I'm going to switch to a wider one, the four millimeters. Sorry, thank you. You okay? Good. And we're going to continue that. Now it's a four millimeter osteotome. And the idea, you have to do it very slowly because this time elapsing between the initial uh, mobilization and the completion of the elevation allows for a tiny amount of swelling to, uh, to infiltrate the adventitia of the sinus mucosal lining, thereby uh, allowing you to um, uh, lift it up uh, a little bit easily. Okay, I switched to a smaller one only because this corner didn't free up and I don't want to use the uh, chisels regularly, the regular chisels, just to mobilize it like that. So, th this kind of technique allows you to really free up a lot of your uh, stress. You use a lot of hammering and makes dentistry a lot more enjoyable, don't you think? <laughs> Give me a hammer any day, right? We'll go back to the wide one. As you all can see now, that window has mobilized. The, the floor does not need to be completely uh, jolly and, and flat and happy, as long as it moves where I want it to move. Before I continue, since we've completed that, I just want to make sure that the uh, membrane here is still intact. So this is a regular sinus lift curette. I'm going to make sure that this is freed up, no uh, hold-ups and, and hang-ups and so on. So, and that allows us to sort of hug the uh, floor of the sinus, mobilizing everything. Okay, we're gonna free it up some more in there, push it in some more. I wanna get the distal part freed up and, and cleaned up, and that's exactly what just happened. So as you see, this, very similar, uh, this, this is very similar to what a window would look like, only on the crest. Okay, is everyone with me? I hope. Yes, we are. All right, nobody fall, fell asleep yet, Clive? Um, about three quarters of the audience. Okay, well, good. That's better than, than uh, being nauseous and throwing up, you know. <laughs> okay, so we've mobilized the, uh, the membrane. I just deliberately will slow down now just to make sure that we are not forcing it um, too much. We mobilize the rectangle, the, the floor, so, called, so to speak, suction right on my instrument. And the idea is we want to make sure that this mesial or anterior aspect is freed. Okay. So now you, you don't have to worry too much about it if, uh, you know, if you don't have the time. But it is always a good practice to sort of lift it up as much as possible, then completing your osteotomy and quickly going from uh, osteotomy to, uh, to sinus graft to implant. And I like to use um, the little gentle tapping. It's better than pushing it, although I, I, there's nothing to fracture now. I'm just elevating the membrane, really. Okay, so now we're finished with this part. 
What I would like to do now to dissipate the, um, the force is to finish up the osteotomy uh, and then push the rest of the membrane while having the um, uh, uh, graft in place. So how do we finish it up? Obviously by hand. As you saw, I've already uh, been able to use the 4 millimeter osteotome. Okay, so there's no need for me to ream the 4 millimeter again. I'm going to go straight up to the 4 and a half. And, and even that is nice and thin. We try that. We can go to the 5. And for that, we could even use the um, dilators or site uh, expanders. I will try it with the reamer. Again, that's pretty wide, nice and wide here. And we'll go <laughs> to five and a half expander, okay? It's like a bullet shape. And again, with uh, mallet, now this is going to snag a little bit, not too much, enough for us to do this. Okay. And then for the second one, Remember, most of the, uh, the holding for the implant is going to be from that rim and the side of the, of the uh, alveolus. So I want to make sure we use that. Okay, again, a little bit of hammer use does the body good, right? Absolutely. Now we finalize it with a combination <coughs> of hand reamers and expanders. Um, the idea is I don't want to have dead uh, crushed bone. But at the same time, I don't want to cut away um, anything if I can use it. So I'll just do the very top of that osteotomy, okay? And then I will dilate the rest or expand the rest. I use the term dilate and expand interchangeably. For the purists, they may not like that, but to me, they mean the same thing. Okay, so this is the six millimeters. So you, I can feel the friction. So the idea is now to, to keep the implant in an area where there is friction and it will stay immobile, okay? And same in the mesial part. And we're almost finished Should with... Yes, sir. Charlie, the first line on the instrument, on the end of the instrument, is six millimeters? Always. Eight millimeters? All of the All of the Bicon, can you zoom in and can you uh, focus on it? All of the instruments in Bicon's kit are uh, consistent in that the first line should be six, second eight, third eleven, and the third, uh, the fourth is fourteen. Okay, so it's always consistent. The the chisels are the same way, the dilators are the same way, the hand reamers, latcher, you name it, all of them have these lines. The only exception, the only exception, is the shouldered abutment depth gauge, but that is relative to the to the abutments, not to the implants. So now. We have finished, thank you. We have finished with the preparation. What we will do now is place the sinus uh, graft and place the implants and be finished. No suction the Okay, and that's it. I'll take a gram of fine. Okay. Any questions from the audience? We're going to use synthograft, fine. You can mix coarse, you can mix, uh, mix it with fine. The idea is, uh, any questions? Yes, we have, one, we have one question here. Yes. Would you consider using the new piezo surgery unit as um, a way of cutting the bone? Um, it doesn't give me the tactile sensation. I can, you know, I can score the bone with it, yes. And I considered having it, you know, I would consider, consider it to thin, for thinning out the bone. Uh, but I think it has some technical challenges that I haven't worked out yet. Is there a question or uh, a uh, demonstration? We have another question. Here. Yes. I'm going to take. Two. Hi, Shadi. It's John. Yes. John Stone, England. Um, if you come across a buttress there, either with that or if you perforate the membrane. What would you do in this situation? I'm sorry, would you repeat your question? I missed the first part. If you come across a buttress in the sinus. The buttress? On that floor there. A buttress. Uh-huh. Sinus buttress. 
Yes. Or if you perforate the membrane, what would you do then with this technique? Uh, okay. The, we, we have everything ready here. We have Surgicel. We have, if you look on the website, we actually, the, one of the first cases, we uh, cut the membrane on one corner inadvertently. And we sealed it with uh, just a um, collagen type of uh, containment device, collagen um, tape, if you will, collar tape, or surgery cell, either so one. Like, or Biomend. Yeah, Biomend might be too, uh, may, may linger on too long. Just move the mouth. Yeah. May linger on for too long. You don't need it. All you need is a containment for your, for your graph, just much as you would do in a sinus lift, you see. Okay, I need Thank to you. 6.5, 6 by 5.7, please. Any other questions? Yes, you will. Hi, Shadi. Just wondering, what if that bone is very thin, the floor of the um, sinus? Does that yes. matter? Um, you, you have to, to choose the case where you can reach, you can reach uh, the um, uh, walls with your window. So if your uh, floor is so wide as to... Um, be far away from the palatal and buccal plates, okay, then your sinus, your implant won't have the primary stability necessary for that. We have another uh, abutment in development right now that will overcome that. At this point, I will use this, uh, this technique when I can have friction against the buccal and palatal walls so that the implant is immobilized thusly. When you don't have, you know, like you said, it's very thin, very wide, very flat, you need to have another means of stabilizing it. And I have a, a, um, an abutment in development right now. Does that answer your question? Okay. Yes, it does. I need the insert retriever and the two abutments. Okay, I'm just getting ready as you're asking your questions, if you don't mind. Okay, very well. Let me place those implants and suture, and then we can take our time answering all of them. How are you doing? Good. Patient is uh, sleeping, so you can ask as much as you want. Yeah, there's a quiz at the end, you know. Okay. So, again, much like an internal lift, you will place your uh, bone graft. Can we back go back to the mouth? Okay, good. We'll place the bone graft first, and use that to uh, mobilize the uh, membrane. Okay. So I was um, just um, told uh, that for some of you who don't have the new, can you turn down the phone? Uh, for those of you who don't have the new white kits that are full, you may not have these uh, uh, dilators in in your kits. So. Uh, I apologize for any confusion. You may not have them. You won't need too much craft, but put as much as you uh, can, compress gently. Okay. I'm using a uh, stainless steel syringe, and we're using, as I said, synthograft. Fine. Yeah. So turn your face slightly to me. And the idea is, as you see now, as I'm pushing in material, it's kind of oozing out. So I know I'm almost at capacity. But what will happen now, when we place our implants, the implants will apply pressure against all of the particles rather than just against the floor and the membrane. This, by putting the, the graft in, will reduce the, um, uh, excuse me, will, will dissipate the, uh, the pressure and allow for more elevation of the sinus. Take this, yes. take a uh, gauze, please. When it's a little bit drier, it'll be a little bit more compact. So to dry it out, as you all know, use a little uh, gauze on the suction. I will suction up the liquid, leave the particles in there for us. So I'm gonna use an inserter retriever with a six by 5.7 millimeter implant, HA coated. And you most often with this technique will need to go to the very wide implants because that is sometimes what it takes to get to the uh, undisturbed buccal and palatal plates, okay? So again, although we could fo force this by hand, it's better to use the, the gentle tapping with the mallet 
to see it because this, although it sounds not very pleasant, is actually uh, a lot gentler on the tissue and advances a lot more uh, kind of conservatively. Now I stop about a millimeter short and then watch where you are. Here. Okay. Can you open wider, Kathy? There we go. Good. That's okay. We'll just leave the implant in there. Then let me put the other implant in. So we'll put the mesial one, then we'll put two abutments, tap them in place, and finish up. And actually, this is the first time we do this case under sedation because we wanted to entice the patient to come in and wait for us for a while while we get everything worked out with you guys. But most often these cases are done in about 20 minutes to half an hour. And uh, there is no need for sedation. Turn your face to me a little bit. I thought you were laughing at my joke. I know you were saying my head is in the way. So I'm feeling resistance. That's always a good thing. By putting the uh, abutment on now, that will act as a nail head. And put that on, please. Let me have these. Okay. And we're almost there. I'm going to need just a little bit more graft. No, no, no. Right here. It's plenty. I just need you to fill up. Just pull it up back about half an inch. Okay, good. Now, the uh, it, for those of you who have used the, uh, the sinus lift abutment, it was designed specifically to have sort of an oblong shape. And you can choose which way to place it based on the anatomy of the flap, the bone, and the area where it needs to work. In this case, I'm going to put it with the longer part, uh, mesio, excuse me, buccopalatally, because that will catch the edges of my osteotomy. It also, um, it, oh, don't swallow it. <laughs> you can use the the um, and that will allow us to then seat the uh, implant fully with the abutment. Let's have the second one. Thank you. If you were to put it the other way, uh, it may not catch as of the because of the rectangle that you've cut. Okay. So we're almost there. Everyone see okay? And now we take the, uh, there's a notch in, in the center of these abutment that's made specifically to fit the three and a half millimeter or three millimeter seating uh, nib or point and that we will tap it the full seating now. Turn slightly to me, I need to see where that goes. Those will be a little bit at some uh, angle because of the uh, mesial cut is always angled. And you want to sit it, seat it uh, at um, the floor as much as possible. Let's see it better this way. Here we go. That's one. Open wider. Okay. Okay. They need to have minimal amount of stability. They don't have to be rigid. Because now, we'll seat them at the bottom. Here we go. Good. Now we'll bond the whole lot with bone graft in between. Okay. Let me have the uh, shoulder depth gauge. This works very well as a condenser. We'll pack them in between. Okay, and don't worry about this slight movement in a little bit. Once it's all wedged together with a blood clot, this does not move at all. I've done this all the time. I need the mirror, I just want to see the back of it. Make sure that the shoulder is covered. Yep. 
So here's what we'll put some more bone in the back. And, and here. Now I'll take scissors. Okay. Uh, it's going to be bone, so I'm taking the liberty. <laughs> it's not bone. Dr. Morgan made a point. It is synthograph. That's correct. Okay. We're going to remove the sutures now, and I'll take a gut suture. And that's it. So before I suture, however, we will... Hold on. Compress everything. Okay, I want to make sure that we didn't overfill it, that there are no points of pressure on that, and then the idea is you want to close it as gently as possible. Okay. Mm -hmm. Selden. Okay, any questions now? Yes, Charlie, there's one question from the Okay, hold from, on one from moment, floor. Clive, please. I can't hear yes. you. One second. <clears throat> okay, go ahead, please. The one question from the floor is that could you do this between, for example, a second premolar and a second molar? If there was a second molar, can yes. you do it in the first molar region? It'll just, it'll just be a smaller window. It'll, you won't have as much, uh, as much uh, latitude. It is very difficult to do this for one tooth if you are limited by the adjacent teeth. In other words, if you only have like one molar missing, well, let me answer that. If you have one molar missing, okay, uh, it'll be a little bit more difficult. You just would go to a regular uh, internal lift, but you can do it. The idea is you need to have a, an area to access and you need to, to be able to see your osteotomes and how they're cutting in there. I just, for, the, um, for those of you who are watching, the, uh, the needle actually cut the suture. That's why I'm tying again. Um, so, yes, does that answer the question? Yes, it does. Thank you very much. Any other questions? Here we go. Janet, can I... Uh, a question about synthograft, does yes, it sir. set? It does not set. This is not cap set. This is not uh, calcium phosphate. It does not set. But a blood clot does, and this is imbibed only in, in uh, blood. And by the time um, this x-ray is taken, you will have a nice congealed clot with the uh, synthograft nicely embedded within it. I notice in the uh, little manual on synthograft, they're talking about a venous blood draw and mixing that with synthograft? Uh, which is exactly what we did. I just didn't let you see that, to not to scare you. You don't have to, excuse me, you don't have to do a venous blood draw. You, the idea is you need to get blood. So if it takes, um, to, you know, it takes you to draw blood to get it, that's fine. Remember, we started the sedation. So when I started the intravenous uh, catheter, I just drew about a cc of blood and left it on the side, and when we needed it, we just used the clot from there. Thank you. Another question Alternatively, here. You, can, you can use the, uh, the incision itself in the mouth, okay? Uh, you may have to stir it up a little bit and get some of the bleeding from that area. For those of us, you know, like our Roman friends uh, who are afraid of drawing blood, this is a very good way to do it. Is that actually Dr. Morgan? Yes, who's this? This is Michael Wood from London. Hello, um, Michael. Presu pre hi. Presumably what you want is quite quick bone turnover and osteogenesis in this area. And we know that tricalcium phosphate um, turns over in about 9 to 15 months. Um, wouldn't irradiated bone be a better proposition in this area? Well, that's assuming that's the, that the only thing you're going to heal with is bone turnover of your graft. You will also have bone formation uh, by the, the presence of the blood. So it's not just uh, the, uh, the uh, beta tricalcium phosphate. And um, I think 
the information you have maybe a slightly um, uh, may not apply completely to the Bicon synthograph because the turnover is a little bit faster than that. Um, and uh, I don't think that will make a significant clinical difference. Surely, I'm going to ask uh, Bill Schaefer to have a word. I, um, I trust he's impre as impressed as I have been. Hi, Shadi. Very, very smoothly done. Hi, Bill. How are you? I'm yeah. <laughs> oh, very well, thank you. Why did you use HA-coated implants instead of the nanotype that you have available over there? You know what? That's a very good question. Uh, I, I've used both, and they work. I just wait longer for both when you've had done a big graft. I, my experience with HA has been it's longer, and uh, I, it's a, more of a habit that I ask for it. But they would both work. Do you have a okay. question at the other side of the auditorium, Charlie? I'm just going around there. We, we are going to quickly, as we are answering the question, we're going to quickly take a, a periapical x-ray. And uh, if the patient is able to walk, we'll get a panorex very, in short order. But at least we'll get an x-ray to show you what we've done. At least I'd like to see what I did, right? Shadi? Yes, sir. Um, what's your rate of infection with this technique? Don't even talk about it. We haven't had an infection in years with any sinus lifts, much less with this technique. So um, I'd like to think, uh, slim to none. The patient is pre-medicated. Uh, and they are placed on an antibiotic for uh, a minimum of five days. Okay, I'll show you. Uh, let me have the small mirror. So it's. I think it's Do equivalent to any to any oral uh, surgery, from wisdom teeth and on. Let me have the Seldon, please. Mm -hmm. Okay. Do you mix any antibiotic with the graft material? Uh, no, I don't. The. Um, Let's have, can we show the, uh, the inside? We don't, we don't mix an antibiotic with it. The uh, synthograft itself has a um, bacteriostatic effect. Can you show the open wider? Good. You see the uh, closure? Sorry, I moved my fingers. Okay, I'll remove that uh, silk suture now that we have it secured. All right. So we don't mix... Um, Sometimes I have, in the past, whenever I've used um, uh, the, uh, you know, the, the bovine origin uh, allografts, I've used a, um, uh, a smidgen, you know, a, se a seasoning of, of tetracycline, if you will. But uh, with the, the uh, degree of, can you retract for me, please? With the degree of acidity of the tetracycline uh, with the beta tricalcium phosphate, we were advised by the inventor that it may alter uh, its composition and make it uh, resorb fast, too fast. <coughs> so uh, we stopped putting that in. Okay, just gonna remove that. Uh, Thank you. Sure. That suture, that's all. Okay. Good. All set. <laughs> Any questions? Well, let's well, go ahead and take well, a quick yes, another, another question. Another question here. You oh. used Marcane. What, what, what percentage was the Marcane of the anesthetic? Um, only because we're, we're working with you. I didn't know how quickly uh, you guys would grasp the concept. We needed longer acting anesthetic and the Marcane <laughs> half a percent. <laughs> hey, you walked into it. I'm sorry. Um, um, it's 0.5 percent with 1 to 200,000 epinephrine. Hi, Shadi. Hi. Are there any circumstances where you would use a, a membrane over the graft? Um, I don't you like using. I don't use, like using membranes under incisions unless I absolutely must. In this case, we had an intact periosteum, and there was no need for us to do any membrane. What, why don't you like the membrane under the incision line? Um, it's a, it's a, it's a weak spot in the area. It prevents. Uh, the, the sort of the blood supply in the area, and I've seen a little more, more br incision breakdowns when there's a membrane underneath than, um, uh, than I care, you know. So I don't like putting incision, uh, uh, membranes under incisions unless there is a compelling reason. And then we will have to spend time immobilizing it with tacks and or 
uh, stay or retention sutures. Bite down, dear. How are you feeling? Okay. Does that answer your question? It's, it's a matter of preference, but I think it's unnecessary. And, and cur the in other thing that was notable was the uh, curved incision line. And that, that goes throughout your surgery for placing Bicon implants, I mean, on a regular basis. It is. Uh, the curved incision lines, as you saw, um, basically uh, the, the hardest part in making the straight line incisions, you know, H type or, or a square type trap door incisions, is the corner. And you end up always overshooting those corners in order for you to cut those last few fibers. Um, that can cause a weak spot at the corner, which can necrose. It can also overshoot uh, kind of across the palate and. Um, Hold on, just give it a minute. And across the palate, you will see um, the, uh, we'll show you the x-ray now in a minute, and you can have some serious bleeding uh, happening. Okay, hold on. Uh, let me just do the x-ray for a minute. Okay, sorry. So uh, by using a curved incision, it's easier to um, show, uh, excuse me, to, to close it. It's easier to also... Um, uh, um, open it, okay? We're going to show you the x-ray now. Here it is. The only thing that we uh, would uh, change would probably make the window slightly more mesial, but at this point, those two will serve very well with the angulation of the mesial uh, implant. Uh, we'll be able to, uh, to, play, to replace these uh, missing teeth. Okay. We're not complaining. Okay. We're not complaining in London. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, how what, what long you? are you going? How long are you going to leave this before the second stage? Four to five months. No less than four, and no. more than five is not going to make much of a difference. Yeah. That looks very fine, Shadi. That has uh, been a very, very impressive demonstration, if I may say so. Thank you. Uh, then I think we need to wrap this up now. I just want to say a very big thank you to you and to all your Bicon team for having put on this amazing performance. Um, it is just quite fantastic that we are talking in real time and watching surgery in Boston real time. And it does mean there's a lot of educational opportunity for the rest of the Bicon family worldwide to tune in for the future. And yes, I... uh, thank you very much for allowing us to be the first to receive this. You're entirely welcome. I think the credit goes to other people. <laughs>